Okay, so reading this passage, it makes me feel like I ought to have at least a goal in life that I am pursuing. But I think even more to the point, this passage indirectly asks each of us and asks us as a church, does our life have a spiritual goal? Do we have a spiritual end to which we are striving? Do we have a spiritual goal that we are pursuing? A few weeks ago, before we got into this sermon series, I preached about how sometimes we want to say no to God. We want to say no to God's invitation to go out and work in the vineyards of our lives and our communities. And in that sermon, I pointed out that the reason why we often want to say no to God when God asks us to go out and work, it's because we have realities that afflict us all of resistance and fatigue and discouragement. And all of these things can discourage us and can tempt us to drop out of any real discipleship altogether. But another danger that we face in our day and age is spiritual aimlessness, a kind of wandering around, doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that, but without any really clear goal of what we are trying to achieve. We do some service, we offer some prayer, we give of some of our resources, but we don't have a strong sense of how it all comes together toward a greater end. As a result, our motivation and our efforts can falter and they can fade away. Honestly, it's hard to strive consistently for something when we're not sure about what that bigger something is. And so sometimes, rather than pressing on in our life of discipleship, we find ourselves petering out. And that is true for us as individuals and as a church. I've often heard David say that from a strategic organizational standpoint, One of the most self-defeating things that we can do if we are trying to move forward is to offer random acts of improvement. Now, while certainly there isn't anything wrong with random acts of improvement in themselves, if we don't have a clear goal that we're working toward, we can shortchange our capacity to make a deeper and a more lasting impact on our community and in our own lives for the sake of the gospel. Our being able to raise the bar and to press on in our following of Jesus needs a clear goal, and thankfully, Paul gives us one. He gives us God's upward call to pursue. And sometimes when you're reading Paul, he can have a lot to say in a very condensed form, and we might have lost track a little bit of what that goal was that he was talking about. So let me just sum it up very concisely. Our goal of discipleship that we press on toward is life in Christ forever. Life in Christ forever. And this goal, this one single goal of life in Christ forever actually has two dimensions to it. One, we want to be in Christ forever physically by sharing in his resurrection. And also, secondly, We want to share life in Christ together forever by spiritually participating in his maturity. So let's look at what these two parts of our goal look like. 
So life in Christ forever through his resurrection happens because we strive, as Paul says, to know Christ and we participate in Jesus' faithfulness. We immerse ourselves in his incarnation, his ministry, his death, and his resurrection. We actively put our trust in Jesus and we receive the ongoing gift of his salvation. And that means we receive his healing, his wholeness, his well-being for our lives now and in the life to come with God after our death. And this dimension of putting our trust in Christ and in the power of his resurrection is so marvelous is that we can entrust our whole lives to Christ. Like Paul, when our trust in Christ is steadfast, we can allow ourselves even to be conformed to Jesus' suffering and his death. When we trust Jesus, we are not defeated by the realities of accepting any disadvantage because of our faith. Like Paul, we will bravely face any form of suffering as we participate in Christ's complete obedience to God's will, as Paul earlier said, even unto death on a cross. When we trust in Christ and the power of his resurrection, we will joyfully jump over whatever hurdles are in our path. We won't count the losses that come from following him. In fact, we will grow in faith to the point of not seeing them as losses at all. Because as Paul says, to gain Christ and to be found in him is everything. All blessings flow from our trusting in Christ and uniting our lives with his, including eternal life with God. So that's the first dimension of our goal of life forever in Christ. The second part of that happens through his maturity, the maturity of Christ, because when we seek to cr trust Christ more fully, we also seek to imitate him more deeply. Paul understands that our being perfected, that's the language he uses here and now, is about ripening into mature Christians. And he says it's an ongoing process. It's going to happen over our entire lifetime, no matter how short or how long that lifetime is. And there's no excuse. There's no excusing ourselves by saying, been there, done that, when it comes to enriching our discipleship. We always have room to grow deeper. Becoming spiritually mature is about living in obedience to God's word in Jesus Christ through the indwelling presence and direction of the Holy Spirit. Christians who are being perfected, who are maturing as Jesus' followers, will experience growth in love, in knowledge of God. They will grow in discernment and integrity. They will bear fruits of the Spirit and they will do good works. And all of their lives will increasingly point other people to God. To put it more simply, becoming spiritually mature means that you are different from what you were before. You are more loving. You're more knowledgeable, more wise, more humble, more willing to serve others, being less focused on yourself, more willing to give of your time, your money, and your effort. And we've seen this again and again in our readings from Philippians, that such spiritual maturity requires a radical reordering 
of our priorities, that we must change from being self-centered to being God-centered and learn to listen and follow God in any and all circumstances. Critical to our developing this maturity of Christ is being consistent in our life of discipleship. It means perseverance in doing those things that will draw us closer to God. And a number of weeks ago, we talked about these things that draw us closer to God in that sermon about staying in love with God. And we identified that those are things that we call spiritual practices, things like worship and community, personal and family prayer, Bible reading and study, fellowship, service, and stewardship, all those things help develop us as mature disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, if this goal, this goal of living in Christ forever, if that seems uh, a tall order, it is. If this goal of both trusting and imitating Christ feels like it's something that we can't do on our own, we are absolutely right about that, and Paul admits as such in our passage. There was one of Paul's phrases that, for me, suddenly summed up what it means to press on. To press on doesn't mean that we reach for our assets or our advantages, whether by birth or privilege or by circumstances. Paul lays aside all of that, and he holds on to the one thing that will allow him to press on, and it is this. Christ has grabbed hold of him. Paul now has everything that he needs because he is found in Christ. He has the strength, the power, and the urgency to press forward toward full maturity and eternal life in Christ. He doesn't need those things of the past. And Christ has grabbed hold of you and of me too. When we become Christians, we are given all that we need for our goal of life in Christ forever. We don't need any other assets. God alone is our resource, and all growth comes by grace through him. In Christ, God has given us all that we need to forget what lies behind and to strive forward to the future that God has for each and every one of us. The point of being Christian and participating in this thing that we call the church is indeed life forever in Christ through trusting him and imitating him. And we press on toward this goal. That's what's ahead of us. That's what we're striving for. It is the real reason that we are here. It's God's call, his upward call for us. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.